Welcome to the program with me, David Foster. Go on, smile, because it's time to find out what makes you happy. Maybe it's the little things, maybe it's money. Perhaps it's simply being content. Stay with us and you might learn how to make life that little bit lighter. There are those who say the COVID crisis has changed our sense of happiness, of well-being. If so, is it for better or for worse? The COVID-19 pandemic has made us rethink so many aspects of our lives. The way we work, the way we socialize, and perhaps even what makes us really happy. A recent report by the Royal Society found just 9% of UK citizens wanted life to go back to the way it was before. It also identified significant changes to our relationships with food, family and the environment. And experts say it is those connections with others that have a big impact on our happiness and well-being. During the pandemic, many people have turned to volunteering and community groups and regularly came together to celebrate the efforts of frontline workers. In so many ways, the well-being of others has taken on new importance. So is our idea of happiness becoming less about us as individuals and more about us as a collective? I'm very pleased to say that joining us, we have Charlie Lee, Senior Lecturer in Psychology at the University of Brighton. We say hello to Christopher Boyce, happiness and well-being expert who's been to the world capital of happiness. We'll find out where that is. And Trudy Edgington, clinical psychology and mindfulness teacher. Good to have you all with us. Charlie, let me come to you first of all. Um, COVID-19 has been so disruptive. How do you think it has changed our basis of happiness? Well, it's, it's really interesting that you should ask that. We don't actually know if it's changed how people understand or talk about happiness yet. That's something that we're interested in looking at, myself and Dr. Emma Anderson. Um, and one way to start is to think that happiness can often be seen as something very individualist, okay? It's something that people um, seek to improve upon. It's something that they see as very personal and very subjective. But actually, there's an alternative view of happiness, that happiness is almost something welfareist and interdependent that relates to mutual support and society. In other words, we're all in this together. And if we're all happy, then we're all happy. And what's interesting then about the impact of lockdown which, as you said, has been hugely disruptive. It's turned people's lives upside down. But something that we might have seen is that people might be um, not only evaluating their own lives differently because of that, but also seeing um, happiness as something more social. The social environment may have changed. Um, there's a we're all in it together mentality there's increased mutual aid, increased volunteering groups, people are helping each other and looking out for each other. So actually, the, the disruption of lockdown may have changed how people talk about and conceptualise um, their own their own happiness. Okay, if I may bring in Trudy at this point, there's been an awful lot of talk about how mental stress has increased because of the lockdown. And, and yet there are suggestions that because people are unable to do very much about things, actually stress levels perhaps have gone down and people are sort of saying, well, this is the way life is. I've got to be happy with it. I think you're absolutely right. I think there's some really interesting um, experiences that people um, have reported. And um, I think it's very individualistic in terms of how people have experienced lockdown. For some people, it's been a great time to be able to reflect and, and spend time with loved ones. And, and um, as Charlie was mentioning, that, that whole sort of sense of being connected and, and that sort of so we can still maintain our social connection with uh, the remote delivery of sort of uh, social media. 
However, for some people, it's been um, a very stressful time. And and I think it's, in a way to me, I, I think lockdown has almost created a, a magnifying glass. It sort of exacerbates uh, our natural uh, sort of experience. So if we are feeling very social and connected, it can actually make us more connected um, if we use those social media tools. But for some others, it can make people feel very isolated without that sort of human touch and human connection. So for me, one of the things that I think is really key to all of this is to almost imagine that we're all in um, the same storm, but we've got different boats and those boats can range in terms of how uh, sort of practical they are and how comfortable they are, but also who's in the boats with us. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very much a case of who you're actually sort of stranded with. And for some of us, that might be a great experience. And for others, that can be quite challenging. Yes, and I suppose you have to hope you're in the lifeboat rather than the one that's holed below the waterline. Um, Christopher, let me bring you in, because fascinating to read that you were a researcher into happiness and that didn't make you happy, so you quit. Yeah, I mean, that about sums it up. So, um, yeah, I was doing research into happiness um, for about 10 plus years, um, trying to understand what the causes are and what people's circumstances that contributed to a happy happy life, particularly focusing on the kind of social or economic circumstances. And I guess I was looking at my own life and thinking, well, I'm going to try and apply as much of this as I possibly can. Um, but I kind of reached a limit and realized actually, hey, there's actually limits in this society which actually bar me from actually doing some of these things because, hey, I've got a job and I need to do certain things within that job. Um, so I was kind of interested in other parts of the world which are trying to create societies which have a more, I guess, more of a collective whole sense of happiness and kind of shared togetherness. And so what I did is I um, basically quit that job and um, ended up on a bicycle uh, journey that took me 18 months, which eventually had me arriving in, um, as you mentioned, the happiness capital of the world, um, the country of Bhutan. And we've got um, some pictures of it. Oh, great. And what did you discover when you got there? Well, I don't think it was about what I discovered when I got there. I think it was what about I, ex I, I explored along the way. Because as well as it being a personal journey, it was also about a bigger journey. Because for me, the journey had real purpose. I mean, what I was interested in doing is I'm interested in living in a society that is more caring, compassionate and kind. And I guess I don't always see that in the society which I was born into. Um, so... I guess I saw things in myself which I was, I was struggling with and I wanted to have that kind of freedom on a bicycle, very simple, humble way of traveling, also very connecting and to, to meet people along the way as well as experience cultures um, and also wider countries where they're actually actively making um, attempts to make uh, more fulfilling well-being lives for its citizens. Because they have this um, system called the Gross National Happiness Index. That's how they measure how well they're doing and how they're helping society, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, Bhutan have, have been um, talking about gross national happiness for, for more than 40 years. Um, and for them, it's kind of a model of sustainable development. It's a way of developing society in a way that actually isn't uh, detrimental to other aspects of well-being. So I guess if you go down the standard path of, you know, more stuff, economic growth is the key, then actually other things get sacrificed along the way. Christopher, I'll come back to you in just a moment. But Charlie and, and then if I may, Trudy, tell me what, how you would define happiness and what happiness means to you personally, Charlie. Okay, so, I mean, I, as an academic, there are lots and lots of ways we can define happiness. Academics um, have been thinking and studying happiness for thousands and thousands of years. We haven't really come to an agreement. There are some standard measures that are used more often than others okay so a really simple way to define happiness is something called subjective well-being which is just almost asking people about their recent moods and then also whether or not they're satisfied with their life but quite a lot of people would say that that's not um that's not getting at happiness in its broader sense but actually what that measure does, satisfaction with life, is that it allows people to individually think about whatever they want, whatever they think makes them happy. It's almost a little black box. We don't know what people are bringing to mind um, when you ask them 
if they're satisfied with their life in various ways, if they're happy. And what about you personally? What makes you happy? Oh, gosh, all, all kinds of things. I mean, I, I definitely look for, I'm definitely a, a glass half empty kind of pessimistic person. It's interesting that we seem to have two, two happiness researchers already who are saying that maybe they're not, you know, happy all the time because that's not a possible thing to be. Um, I certainly look for lots of little pockets of joy around. Um, but generally, relationships with others is without doubt, according to research, something that's hugely important to well-being and happiness. But also... Well, let, let, me, let me bring this... Sorry to butt in there, but let me bring right. up this, um, this picture on the screen. This was from um, the Happiness Report of 2020. And it's relative contributors to happiness, social relationships. That's why I wanted to come in there. 43% uh, freedom or agency chance to do what you think is the right thing. 24% wealth, only 7%. Um, but this fascinated me. Health, life expectancy, only 1%. It's relationships. Trudy, is it that you think matter most in happiness? I absolutely. And and I think within happiness as well, I think what's really important is to sort of pick apart the different elements of happiness, because there's a feeling of happiness, that, that sort of emotion or that joy that we feel. But there's also the thinking behind it. So the cognition and how we appraise our situation. So unfortunately, our brains are very much about sort of judging and comparing. So I think sometimes we can feel contented and happy. And actually, sometimes it's about peace of mind as well. So for me, in some ways, happiness is almost an absence of a negative emotion. So an absence of anxiety or stress or worry or, or low mood. And that sense of connection with others, a sense of purpose where we can flourish but also a sense of mindfulness so that we're actually savouring the present moment. So people that can actually be grounded in their present moment experience tend to experience more happiness because they're actually sort of paying attention to all the little bits of, um, you know, sort of mm. looking and immersing ourselves into nature, thinking about that connection and love and um, being able to flourish. So it's very much about the journey in some ways. So it's really interesting about thinking about ways that we can be happy. And, and sort of, for me, when I think about my happiness, I, I, I really enjoy dancing. So having a, a way of expressing yourself uh, in being connected with your own body and with others. So a, a real sense of joy, synchrony, and, and being able to flourish and, and learn something new. So I think there's a, there's a learning aspect to this too. So it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, what Can I just say is. the two, two words that come up quite often when you're looking into this, researching it, as I did almost from an amateur basis, are resilience and flexibility. And I suppose, um, Christopher, if that means you mustn't fight against the things you can't change, and you've got to be flexible enough to sort of say, well, I could be happy in another way as well. I think it's fair to an extent. I think the word resilience is a term that's used quite a lot at the moment. The idea of, you know, so dealing with challenging situations. And yes, challenging situations are going to come up um, all of the time and we need to know how to deal with them. But that doesn't mean that we should, you know, have to experience challenging situations to become stronger and be resilient and train resilience. We also have to look at our circumstances and yes, accept them in a certain way. Um, and find some meaning and value in them. But we also need to challenge those circumstances because sometimes those circumstances have come about um, in a way that isn't supportive to us as individuals. And obviously other people have those circumstances as well. Um, so yes, we need to accept where we're at, but we also need to think about what supports us in those situations such as you know social relationships maybe being physically and mentally healthy maybe doing the work there maybe the surrounding environment and society as well and there were you on the road on your bike for so long on on your own did your absence of relationships in that situation affect your sense of happiness love certainly i mean i left a lot uh, of people when I, I i went on this journey um so but that didn't mean that I didn't have those people with me in a certain way. 
And I guess the really interesting thing I wanted to explore, so I spent a, a good 10 months in Latin America. Um, and there, I mean, they're the country renowned for that kind of real emphasis on social relationships, which is why those countries are some of the happiest in the world in terms of the feeling happiness sense um, that was described earlier. Um, and there they have a huge emphasis on social relationships. So although it wasn't deep, close relationships, what I found is that people connected with me very openly and very freely. Um, and what I found is it was more my own kind of fear of actually interacting in that way, which I think come, kind of comes culturally. But once I got over that, you know, I, I had so many great experiences where I'd meet a random stranger in, in the street. And the next thing I know, I'd be sitting uh, with their family eating dinner with them. Um, maybe I'd even stay the night or I'd camp in the garden or something like that. Um, so through that, I kind of found that, OK, I didn't have the, 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 the relationships from back home but they were there for support. But in the immediate term, I had so many people that I connected to. Christopher, I'll come back to you with this question that I'm going to put to Charlie. How would you advise somebody to, to find happiness? Well, actually, that, that word that you just mentioned, flexibility, and to link that in with what Trudy was saying, that there's this cognitive, this thinking process that we have to go through when we assess whether or not we're happy or satisfied. And certainly happier people will tend to focus on the best bits of their life, whether or not they are the, the more important bits. So, for example, during lockdown, when maybe relationships were, were um, when people were less able to have the same kind of relationships that they would usually have, some people would then focus on something else. In other words, the happier people are those who are more flexible. They can focus on the bits of their lives that are the source of happiness, whether or not they are the most important bits usually. And actually, the less satisfied and the less happy people will not be able to kind of change that focus away from the things that are currently less satisfying to focus on something that um, brings them an element of satisfaction or happiness. So being able to kind of pick and choose and zone onto the best bits while the worst bits are the worst bits is, is probably yeah. something. If, if everybody was happy, Trudy, there would be no need necessarily for, for mindfulness coaches. <laughs> so does that say something about the society today in which we live? Uh, that's a, a really good question. But I think mindfulness is is almost a sense of being. It's it's not just a, a sense of finding something to give you happiness. It's a way of actually dealing with the way our minds work. And I, and I think it's getting in touch with our own humanity. We have a very sophisticated brain that um, takes us uh, into some mental time travel. So we can go back to the past and we can take ourselves into the future. And that can be amazing because we can remember childhood events and we can think of our plans for holidays and think about the future. But also that can lead to rumination and, and sort of overthinking or worrying about the future. So mindfulness allows us to be really, again, coming back to flexibility, that we can choose where we want to land our attention. And we can, we can focus on the past or we can focus on the future, but actually it's the present moment that gives us the opportunity to savour all of the present experiences. And actually sometimes not just dealing with the happiness, but also going towards difficulty, but doing it in a way that we're grounded, that we're connected and supported, and that we can actually sort of have a sense of distance. So we can have what's referred to as equanimity. We can go towards that difficulty, but we can sort of look at it and go towards it when we need to and, and come away when we need to. And again, it's, that, it's, it's very much a, a thinking flexibility that we can go towards our uncomfortable feelings, but also savour the joy, savour the love and, and the kindness and the gratitude. So if we bring so our no attention to... contradiction then, sorry to cut you off, That's but okay. no contradiction in the fact that you rely on your memories perhaps to make you happy. Um, things could, that could happen in the future uh, to give you a sense of well-being. And yet you say you should stay grounded in the present. 
to me, it's, a, it's about having the flexibility to, to choose where you want to land your attention. So, you know, there are times when it's great to be, able to be able to go back to our memories and have that sense of nostalgia. But if we have a, a traumatic memories, for instance, we might not want to stay with those memories. And sometimes if it's a traumatic memory or a difficult memory, it can actually sort of capture our attention. Or if we're unduly worried about the future, if we're afraid, if we have a very sort of severe anxiety, we get captured with that fear or that threat. So it's being able to make those choices and, and sort of go between and, and staying in the present moment. It's not about staying in the present moment all of the time. It's about dropping into the present moment when we want to feel connected mm. and grounded. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost a skill. You have to almost train your mind to do that. Um, you have to know when is the right term. You, you have to have good judgment, I suppose. And that it, comes with, with practice. Charlie, um, let me ask you this. It's a lot of volunteering, a lot of helping people who are in need, those particularly who couldn't go out of their homes for such a long period of time. Is it possible that we will come out of this COVID crisis and, and, and think, actually, I, I've found myself again? Yes. I mean, it, but as as we mentioned earlier, it's going to be a very, very different experience for everybody. There will be some people, for example, who were furloughed, who've been out of their usual job, who may realise that actually that job wasn't for them. Maybe they've had the time and space to do other things. Um, maybe there are people who um, have now had the time to do more voluntary work or community work and they've discovered something about themselves that they didn't know before. So there may be some positive outcomes for some people, but we do have to remember that it's been a very, very traumatic time. It's very, It's been a very tragic time for a but lot can, of Can everybody learn in some way or another how to make themselves more content? Well, we kind of go back in a full circle now, don't we? We go back to this idea, is happiness something that we as an individual are responsible for? Is it up to me to make myself happier? Or should actually the community, the world at large, society, our social environment be providing me and us with a better world to live in? Well, that is a question we just have to leave hanging hanging up in the air. And you, you talked about people changing their career paths, which brings us back uh, to Christopher. I've got two questions for you. The first one is, I, I wonder how somebody who's been on that journey that you went on, 25 countries, 20,000 kilometers, can still say when you advise people on happiness that you have days when you are still crippled by uncertainty. Yes. That's very true. I kind of I'm, I'm thinking about the, the answers to the last question. I also feel like I've got an answer to that as well. So I'd like to come back a little bit um, and talk we about. We don't have an more. awful lot of time left in okay. the program to talk about Whatever the kind of individual want. pursuit of happiness. Um, and we need to kind of get over that in a little sense um, because we can make choices and we can do things that, that make us happy. Um, but we're also within a society that doesn't necessarily support that. So I was hearing the stuff about mindfulness and it's very interesting, but what is it about a society that prevents us from being mindful in the first place? So such as all the distractions and so forth. So in terms of my actual trip um, and the down days, which are inevitable, uh, and in terms of how I feel about my life, whether I'm happy or whether I'm anxious, you know, it's up and down and it always will be, which is why we also need to get off that kind of, I mean, some kind of happiness in a feeling sense, is somewhat elusive, it is up and down. But there are other types of sense, um, senses of happiness where we're more grounded in ourselves, where we feel or what we're doing is meaningful, although it doesn't necessarily make us feel elated, um, can bring a really deeper sense of happiness. So for me, when I'm feeling down, the important thing is okay. to be aware and acknowledge that, but also tap into the fact the reason I'm doing this is really important for me because it is it um, it it means I'm, I'm achieving certain goals. And yeah, you're looking for something. In my life. Can I end with this one? Um, can a person, this is for you, Christopher, can, can a person who chooses to be miserable be happy? I mean, happiness is a multifaceted thing. So you may be doing something that generally makes you feel miserable in a daily sense. I mean, lots of people have jobs that they don't particularly enjoy, but on another level, it does feel deeply meaningful to them. 
and we can take the case. But, but if you choose to be miserable rather than you become miserable, um, that that is a calling, isn't it? And it could make you happy. Choose Being a bit misery. facetious. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there is a certain amount of choice that we don't have over our circumstances and our situations. Um, yeah, I don't think happiness is a simple choice. We just do these things and then it will be OK. And it's easy to say that when people are facing very difficult situations, a lot of differences in how people are experiencing the pandemic and lockdown um, to say that you just need to do X, Y and Z to be happy. I, I think there's, there's not as much choice as we would like to think in terms of happiness, then we have to come back to our society and how that is or isn't supporting our ability to be happy. Thank you very much indeed. I'm happy to say it's been a pleasure uh, to talk to each <laughs> and every one of you. But the programme is now over. You've got to go out and make your choices. You've got to make some difficult ones and perhaps you will find happiness. Not, not you three, but all of those people who might be watching now. Uh, and indeed myself. Thank you very much for taking part in the programme and thank you very much indeed for watching. I'm David Foster. We hope to have your company on Roundtable on another occasion. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>